All right, guys, well, we finally did it. We crossed the Atlantic. We are now here in Horta in the Azores, or it's pronounced the Azores. It's not a hard A. Calm down, Americans. You gotta say things the way that other people say things. Anyway, so we did it. We crossed the Atlantic, and this episode is gonna be all about sailing, experiencing huge waves and big storms, and it's gonna be so exciting and full of adventure. Actually, no, I'm sorry, guys. This episode is gonna be about boat projects. We're still in Washington, North Carolina, but this is the last project episode before we start moving and before we start our Atlantic crossing. And then there's going to be all the exciting stuff, storms, fighting off pirates with swords and stuff. It's going to be super awesome. In this episode, I've got to install a toilet. That's right. It's the moment you've all been waiting for. But we also do super exciting stuff like tie down the dinghy to the foredeck and put our outboard in our cockpit locker. Oh, and also Desiree goes to Sam's Club. Who needs the Atlantic Crossing when you've got such exciting content like this? But seriously guys, this week is just about tying up all of the little loose ends to make sure that we're ready for this huge crossing ahead of us. That's gonna really serve us well for years to come. I'm Desiree, and this is my husband, Jordan. We're sailing around the world, or at least trying to. We made it as far as Panama on our first boat, Atticus 1, which was a really small fixer-upper. Now we're on our dream sailboat, Atticus 2, but she needs some work before she's ready to cross oceans. So we're working hard to finish up the last of our boat projects so we can set sail on our biggest adventure yet, crossing the Atlantic Ocean. All right, so I'm coming down to the last couple projects before our Atlantic crossing that we absolutely have to do. Like if we don't do it, we don't get to leave. And so my project today is gonna be figuring out the way that we're gonna store the dinghy on the foredeck when we're sailing offshore. Now we've got our super cool fancy davits off the stern and that's gonna be great for motoring in protected waters, for sailing in protected waters, or even like day sailing. But for true offshore sailing, those davits are not even close to strong enough. So the foredeck is where we're gonna store the dinghy when we're doing serious offshore sailing. And so I'm going to, for the first time, hoist the dinghy up onto the foredeck and just sort of see how it sits and what we want to do. All right, so I think this is what we're gonna do for stowing the dinghy. So we've got this really nice ratchet strap. I've also got these Dyneema lines going from these heavy duty connection points got a couple of lines aft, making sure that the stern doesn't move up or side to side. So one thing that I did have to do, I wasn't sure if I wanted to have like custom chocks installed on the deck that the dinghy could like fit into. Steve Brody from Pacific Seacraft actually gave me the great idea to just use some blocks of closed cell foam. Feels like that scene from Ace Ventura 2, where he crawls out of the rhino's ass. One on the bow and one on the transom so that all that load would be distributed evenly and there wouldn't be any like point loading. And I've been really trying to like take John Kretschmer's advice to heart and that is to not have perfect be the enemy of good enough in this situation. Because we've only got like two weeks until we need to be leaving Washington and we need to get some stuff done. You excited to sail across the Atlantic? Yeah? You're a good boy. All right, so right now I'm going to attempt to get the outboard down into this cockpit locker. Basically, I want to know if we would be able to store it down there for the Atlantic crossing. The rail mount that we have it on right now is super strong. That said, if we're gonna do a giant sail like sailing across the Atlantic, I'd like to maybe be able to stow it somewhere where it's not exposed to waves and whatnot. So anyway, Desiree and I are going to attempt to carry that heavy bad boy all the way over here and drop it into the cockpit locker. Okay, so that looks 
like okay. It, it, to be honest, it doesn't look very good. It's in there kind of wonky. The shape of the locker and kind of the angle of the hull makes it so that we don't have a whole lot of options. I want to install a couple eye bolts so that I can use a ratchet strap and kind of like really secure that outboard tight against the bulkhead so that if when we're offshore and we're moving around a lot, the outboard doesn't jostle around at all. She ain't pretty, but that'll work. Whew, it's getting hot here, man. That's when you know it's time to cross the Atlantic, when it's getting too hot. <laughs> All right, so another thing we gotta do to prepare for the crossing is we need to make sure that we have space for at least three people to sleep while we are sailing offshore. You can't just sleep anywhere on a boat when you're offshore because the motion can be pretty violent. You need to be in a place where you're kind of tucked in where you can't really move around too much. The way that we accomplish that is through lee cloths. The boat already came with a lee cloth on the port settee. The quarter berth doesn't really need a lee cloth because it's sort of a narrow place with walls on either end. But the nuz station here wouldn't really work for sleeping here if conditions were rough. So we designed a lee cloth with our friend Rodney at Allison Sales and Canvas, and he brought that to us today. So I'm going to start installing the hardware so that we can actually use that lee cloth for this upcoming crossing. How you like it, buddy? It was really good. In fact, if you need a test napper, just make sure it's good <laughs> and available. Okay. Ugh. Yeah, that's snug. You look very snug. Oh, buddy, leave me here. <laughs> so let's say you need me on deck to like save the day or whatever. I'm like, I'm on it. Pop that bad boy. I'm out there. <laughs> I really like this part of the setup because I hate having to actually set up a lead cloth every time we're getting ready to go underway so the nice thing about this system is that it's permanently installed under here so, sweet look at that lead cloth's gone nuzzle station time to lay down again buddy <laughs> am i the worst pregnant lady that ever lived what i'm hoping for here are comments like no desiree it was exactly the same for me you're great <laughs> wink wink ladies <laughs> yeah Okay, so next, you may remember that I needed to get a new gasket for the pedestal here. Well, turns out that it, it doesn't seem like it's easy to get a replacement gasket. I just went ahead and bought like a generic pipe gasket on McMaster car that I think should work. So I'm gonna get this in place, drill the holes for the fasteners, and then like trim it up, see if I can make this work. Well, today I am going in for battle. I'm getting ready to head to Sam's Club to start provisioning for our Atlantic crossing. Steve, who is going to join us on the Atlantic crossing, has volunteered to let me borrow his Sam's Club card today, and also to help me with provisioning, which is awesome. So thank you so much, Steve. I had Jordan send me the dimensions of the freezer, and it's 15 inches long, six inches wide, and 12 inches tall. So it's fairly small. That's a very small space. Let's start with the meat. I okay. think it's over that way. Okay. This will be for the big morale booster. All right. I feel like this is going to be a passage where we're going to eat very, very well. Bunch of nuts for snacks, some Listerine to keep us nice and fresh out there. But yeah, I think we did really good. We just kind of stocked up on meat and then a couple of dried goods. And then a couple of days before we leave, I'll go to the grocery store and get a bunch of our fresh fruits and veggies. And we're gonna eat well. Yes, we're gonna eat like kings, man. All right, so I've got most of our dry goods back on the boat. So I'm gonna spend kind of like a rainy day organizing our dry goods. I got these containers 
on Amazon. So now I'm just going through and consolidating all of my similar grains together. Hopefully we'll just uh, stay organized and have a lot of food for the crossing. <laughs> All right, stage two of provisioning for the Atlantic. We found a house with a great kitchen <laughs> that we could prep all of our meat that we bought the other day. There's a freezer right behind Steve <laughs> where we can actually put all the meat once we've prepped it and vacuum sealed it so that by the time we transfer it over to Atticus, it'll be in like really perfectly shaped cubes and it'll all hopefully fit in our freezer. So, got a lot of meat touching to do. <laughs> where that came from. All right, well, this is our last piece of meat. It's been about two hours of handling meat. meat. <laughs> I told you, we were touching a lot of meat. All right, well, we're all done. Only took us like three hours. <laughs> but I think we're gonna eat really well on the passage, so thank you so much. Absolutely. So one of the big takeaways we learned after chatting with John Kretschmer is that man overboard is probably the largest concern that we should have while crossing the Atlantic Ocean. So we wanted to have a system in place to help us to find the person if they fall overboard, as well as to be alarmed to the fact that someone has fallen overboard. When it comes to shorthanded crews like ours, often there's only one person in the cockpit at a time. Especially at night, the other crew are gonna be down below sleeping. And so if that person on watch were to fall overboard, there's a chance that the other crew wouldn't actually know about it until they came up for their watch and realized that no one was there. So that's why we're going to carry on board a product by ACR called the OLAS system. And how it works is every single crew member is going to wear one of these wristbands. It kind of looks like a watch that doesn't tell time. And then we've got the OLAS core, which is this device right here next to me. And basically if the distance between the tag and the core becomes so great that obviously someone has fallen off the boat, then the core sounds an alarm. And then once the alarm is sound, the crew on board can open up an app on their phone that knows exactly where the boat was when the person fell overboard. And the app actually makes it really easy to find them again. So there's like an arrow that points you in the direction of where the boat was when the person fell overboard. So anyway, yeah, I think this system is great. I feel like it really will increase our safety a lot in terms of somebody potentially falling overboard. So you may remember that a while back, we had to remove the insulation on this engine compartment door. Now the insulation in the engine bay is actually there to keep the sound of the engine down. So without the insulation on this door here, it actually is pretty darn loud inside of the boat. So one thing I wanna do before we take off on this crossing is put new insulation on this bad boy. So I'm gonna clean this up, cut the new insulation and glue it on. So I was able to glue on this new foam onto the access panel for the engine compartment. I also put on some new foam onto this hinging piece up here. It was starting to droop and fall. So yeah, let's start the engine up and kind of see how loud it is. And then we'll put these in place and see how much better it is. Dude, that's like magic. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> Good job, bud. It's amazing how well it works, you know? You can definitely hear it. It's definitely a noise, but like it doesn't disrupt conversations. It's not gonna make living in this boat with the engine running the pain in the neck that it was before. So I'm glad we were able to do that.
Okay, so the last actually substantial project that I've got on my list is to replace the toilet or the head. I'm so torn about this because this head works really well. Like I like it a lot, but there's two things wrong with it. First, it's been leaking a little bit for like months and I've been trying to figure out where it's been leaking from and I've checked all the hoses and all the rubber fittings and everything like multiple times. Finally, I realized there's a pinhole at the bottom of the bowl. The body or housing of the toilet is hollow and so water leaks from the bowl into the hollow of the housing and then comes out the base all the way down at the bottom which is why it was so hard for me to figure out where it was coming from now i could just like grind out that hole and epoxy it but this head is designed for freshwater use only so every time we flush this thing it actually pulls like drinking water out of the tanks sometimes you got to flush the toilet a lot right i'm not going to go into details but like you can use a lot of fresh water flushing this thing. And so for the Atlantic Crossing, that really wouldn't work. Like it'd just be a huge waste of fresh water. But one thing I really like about the fresh water toilet is that it doesn't smell. Most marine heads that use raw water to flush have like a really like kind of strong odor. And that actually comes from the salt water sitting in a lot of the lines for long periods of time. And that's been one of the fun things about this boat is it like doesn't smell like a boat. It doesn't have any of that like, you come down you're like, ooh, okay. And a lot of boats have that. So I'd really like to keep that aspect of the freshwater toilet, but yet be able to flush with raw water. And so there is a toilet that Raritan makes that basically you can switch between raw water and fresh water. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. So it's kind of a bummer because this is a great toilet it, but we bit the bullet we bought the new head and I'm just gonna like hunker down and try to install this thing as quickly as I can seven years ago when we first bought Atticus one and I first started working on boat projects I would have messed up at every stage of this toilet install. I wouldn't know how to fix the problems I caused. I wouldn't even know where to go to figure out how to fix them. I would just blindly feel my way through the issue and slowly arrive at a somewhat workable result. But here now, seven years later, this project is going exceptionally smooth precisely because I stumbled through so many hundreds of different boat projects, wasting countless hours trying to figure out what to do do and hardly ever coming up with the right solution. People often ask me how I learned a lot of these skills. And the real answer is actually sucking at doing this stuff until I slowly stopped sucking so much. ready to test this. You want to check it out? All right, let it rip, buddy. Well, you can't see it from up there. Oh, okay. You got to come down here. I was going to take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, got to turn the head on. It's not obviously all done, but... Is water going to squirt everywhere? I don't know. Let's, <laughs> let's be optimistic here. Okay. okay, so I think this fills it. Okay. Looking good. Yeah. <laughs> water. Oh, sh Uh-oh. Uh, okay, that's not supposed to happen. Yeah, oops. It's okay, you'll get her done. <laughs> you go pee, so I'm gonna go to the marina bathroom. Okay, you go. So I think what just happened is I wanted to plumb the freshwater side of this new head first thing, because that way we could actually use the toilet if this takes me more than a day to install. But I think that the way that the plumbing in the toilet works is that I can't use the toilet at all until we've plumbed both the fresh water and the salt water side of things. So I'm gonna start doing the raw water side. I've gotta start with installing the new raw water pump, so I'll do that now. Okay, so I've got the pump installed, and now I'm going to connect a new fitting to a seacock that's actually been here the whole time we've owned the boat. So I'm gonna remove this cap, and actually I'm gonna remove this elbow that they've got on here, put on a new elbow, and then connect hose from the seacock to the pump. Okay, so now that that's in, the next step is because the toilet 
is actually below the water line. There's the risk that we could siphon raw water into the boat through this raw water system to the head. So to make sure that doesn't happen, we've got to put an anti-siphon loop into this raw water line. And we want that siphon loop to be as high up in the boat as possible. And in fact, there's already a couple of anti-siphon loops up here in this cabinetry. And so that is where we're gonna add the new one. So I'm gonna drill a couple of holes in there using a hole saw and an angle drill, and then run the hose from the pump up to that loop, and then run it down to the toilet. As with almost all plumbing projects on boats, the hardest part of the project is working in a confined space that I can barely reach. Half the battle seems to always be moving something just a little bit this way or that way using your fingertips. My hands start to cramp up. I always seem to notice blood on the hose before I realize I'm bleeding. And sweat always seems to trickle into my eyes when I'm in a position where I can't wipe it away. There's so many hose clamps in here that like every little one cuts my hand as I'm trying to get this wire up in there. But like I can't put gloves on because like I need to feel this tiny wire getting up into one of these holes through the cabinetry. It's funny because right now I'm trying to zip tie this new wire to the wire run. So the rest of the wires that are way back here, but I can only get to all that stuff with one hand. Tying a zip tie around stuff with one hand is a hard skill. I still suck at it. <laughs> it's a lot harder than it sounds. Yes, that's the sound I'm looking for. Okay, so we are all hooked up. Let's hit the breaker. Okay. So it's kind of funny with electrical projects, deciding whether it worked or not. It's just when I push the button, does it go ring? You know what I mean? So much work and like the simplest little payoff. All right, let's see if it happens. It's gonna select C and then just push and hold this. Check it out. <laughs> That's definitely river water, all right. In situations like this where we're at a dock, we can just switch right over to fresh and then rinse all that nasty water out. When we need to conserve fresh water, we can. And when we wanna make sure that nothing smells and we've got plenty of fresh water disposal, we can use fresh water. So that's gonna really serve us well for years to come. You're looking particularly frumpy today, buddy. Buddy, I'm allowed to be <laughs> frump -a dump for yeah. the next nine months. So Desiree, what lessons did we learn this week? That frumpy is the new sexy. I think we also learned that vacuum sealers are really awesome mm -hmm. and that we wish we could have one on the boat. Houses are great. Yeah. They got a lot of space. Yeah. So tomorrow is our last day in Washington. I mean, we're getting really pumped about moving. We've still got a lot of stuff to do before we're like ready, ready. But at least two days from now, we are going to be on the move again. And that's going to feel so good. I'm excited to kind of like be done with all these boat projects and finally start to enjoy the boat as a sailing vessel. We've accomplished a lot in the last, what, six months that we've been here. When we were on the hunt for Atticus 2, I think our number one thing <laughs> was we wanted to spend less time working on boats and more time sailing. And like, we have failed at that. <laughs> in this first year. <laughs> the problem is, is that I didn't incorporate this concept of outfitting a boat and how much work that is, right? I think we've gotten this boat to a, a point that Atticus 1 never would have been at. You know, we trust all the systems completely. And so I think our 
timeline for being able to enjoy it is going to be longer. Mm -hmm. I also feel like we're so comfortable on this boat too. Mm -hmm. That was always an issue with Atticus 1. We would like seek out comfortable places. Whereas with this boat, we're comfortable wherever we are. It's sustainable in the sense that we have solar panels and we make our own electricity, but it's also sustainable from like a personal level. Point is, we're sad but ready to close the book on this chapter. No, turn the page to close the page on the last chapter, which then opens up to the new chapter. Mm. We're going to turn the page to the next chapter, <laughs> but we're going to keep a bookmark yeah, we're not in the old the chapter. Book. Okay, here's to the next chapter. We'll see you guys there. I'm going to throw up. Well, don't throw up on the book. <laughs>